Welcome back, everyone, as we continue our look at the history of Russia uh, using our friends over at Epic History TV and their fantastic series on the history of Russia. This is going to be part three. Uh, as always, I will put a link in the description to the original content uh, so you can check that out with my without my commentary. And I should let you know as well that because they've seen a, a pretty significant increase in viewership of that History of Russia series, they have made the decision to donate uh, all of their income from ad revenue from that series throughout this month to causes related to the humanitarian crisis that is happening in Ukraine right now. So I think that's fantastic and well worth our support. Uh, we're going to go ahead and dive right into this, but stick around at the end. I have a couple of suggestions on some further videos that you might want to watch to follow up about part three of this series. Here we go. In the early 1700s, Peter the Great's reforms put Russia on the path to becoming a great European power. But it was his grandson's German wife, Catherine, who deposed her husband to become Empress of Russia. So one of the things that's pretty interesting about this time period where you've got Peter the Great and Catherine the Great, uh, these two uh, that have come, gone down in history as the great, uh, is that they come on the heels of a series of pretty weak and ineffective emperors in Russia. And that's a common theme, I think, that happens throughout history, where you have certain people who stand out from a time when their country was not well led. Abraham Lincoln was the 16th president of the United States and almost universally uh, remembered as one of the top two or three presidents in American history. But he comes on the heels of a series of very weak and ineffective rulers or uh, presidents. Uh, and many of the ones who followed him were not particularly effective either. And part of that is the, the times in which they lived, which were uh, very difficult for anybody and anyone who was not exceptional was probably doomed to fail. And these were men who maybe in other periods of history might have done pretty well as president. So part of it's the time in which they live, but also part of it is that when you have somebody who comes along who's exceptional as a leader and has those uh, qualities that are necessary and has the right background and, and leads the right way, they can really stand out from the pack. Who oversaw the completion of that transformation. Like Peter, she too would be remembered as the Great. Catherine was a student and admirer of the French Enlightenment, and even corresponded with the French philosopher Voltaire. So here's another you know, commonality that she's got with Peter the Great, uh, is that both of them learned a lot from the West, from places like France, for example. They didn't shut themselves off and believe that Russia's way was the only way. They saw good things happening in other places and tried to bring those things to their country. She reigned as an enlightened autocrat. Her power was unchecked, but she pursued ideals of reason, tolerance, and progress. And you know, some people might look at that and think an enlightened autocrat, well, that's kind of an oxymoron. But you know, here's the thing. A lot of people in history have had uh, great intelligence and uh, great power and have had the ability to affect powerful change. But many people in history in those positions of power have used that power only to enrich themselves and the people they cared about. Uh, instead of enriching their country and making the lives of their people better. Now, I'm not saying that Catherine the Great made everyone's lives better. There were plenty of people who did not thrive under her. But I truly believe she did desire what was best for her country, her adopted country. Because remember, she's German by birth. Germany doesn't exist yet. She's Prussian. But um, you know, I, I think she, she really did embrace Russia as her home. 
Uh, she embraced the religion. She embraced the culture. She embraced the language. And she did everything she could to be Russian and to do what she thought was best for the Russian people. And, and you see that throughout her reign, just the, um, the cultural uh, things she did to make the culture better and things that she did to make education better and make people's lives better. Not everyone's lives, but a lot of people's lives. A lot of other people in her position of power and authority did not use it to benefit others. Catherine became a great patron of the arts and learning. Schools and colleges were built. The Bolshoi Theatre was founded, as well as the Imperial Academy of Fine Arts, while her own magnificent collection of artwork now forms the basis of the world-famous Hermitage Museum. Catherine encouraged Europeans to move to Russia to share their expertise and helped German migrants to settle in the Volga region. Now, remembering that she herself is German, this makes a lot of sense. But again, here's that idea that, hey, Russia is not everything. There's a world beyond us. And there are people that are not Russian who could benefit our country in some way. And, uh, you know, bringing in people who might add to the culture, who might add to the nation, who might add with their skills and their abilities to the betterment of everyone. I think that's uh, quite an enlightened, uh, enlightened ideal on her part. And I believe these Germans are there uh, until at least uh, World War One, World War II, the, the, you know, the early parts of the 20th century. Uh, and we see a lot of that anti-German backlash that happens in World War One and World War II. We see that here in America as well. Um, in America, I've talked about this before, street names got changed. In the town I grew up in, we had one called Dutch Lane. Now, Dutch, you would think, well, what's that got to do with Germany? Well, uh, in this region of the country, there's a dialect of German known as Pennsylvania Dutch. It has nothing to do with Dutch. It's German. It's a hybrid of German and English kind of mixed together and, and even have some, some of its own words. But it was associated with Germany because Deutsch, Dutch. Um, and so they changed it to Liberty Street. Uh, the British royal family, their house name was the House of Saxe, Coburg and Gotha, which is German. They changed it to the House of Windsor to, to disassociate themselves with Germans. And, and the same thing happens here in the 20th century with these Volga Germans. Where they became known as Volga Germans. Their communities survived nearly 200 years until on Stalin's orders, Stalin, that's they were who it was. deported east at the start of World War II. Catherine's reign also saw enormous territorial expansion. In the south, Russia defeated the Ottoman Empire, winning new lands and the fortresses of Azov and Kerch. So again, Russia's uh, you know, one of their biggest rivals and enemies during this period of history is going to be the Ottoman Empire. They share common borders, but they have very different religions, very different backgrounds. And, and so it's kind of a natural rivalry there. Uh, they've got the borders here. They've got the borders there. They've got the Black Sea in between, which is huge. And there again, you see some territory that they've taken that is now a part of Crimea, which we see today in history still being fought over. But then Catherine faced a major peasant revolt, led by the renegade Cossack Yemelian Pugachev. The rebels took many fortresses and towns and stormed the city of Kazan before they were finally defeated by the Russian army. So let's talk a little bit more in depth about the Pugachev revolt and what that looked like. So Pukachev's rebellion, uh, compared to a lot of uh, civil wars and a lot of conflicts that happened involving Russia, was pretty minor in terms of the size. The Russian Empire only had about 5,000 men that were involved, uh, taking on as many as 25,000 on Pukachev's side. Uh, Pukachev was a coalition of Cossacks, Russian serfs. We talked about the serfs previously, old believers, and, and non-Russian peoples within the Russian Empire. 3,500 killed. Uh, on the Russian Empire side, the vast majority of the people involved in the rebellion were killed uh, on their side. So uh, pretty bloody, bloody for the people involved. And Pukachev himself was executed in Moscow in 1775. So it didn't really end well for them. Catherine then forcibly incorporated the Zaporozhian Cossacks into the Russian Empire and annexed the Crimean Khanate, Crimea. a in Russia's side for 300 years. And it again will be fought. There'll be a Crimean War about 70 years later. 
There'd be more recent wars even in the last 10 years or so fought over Crimea. Russia's new lands in the south were named Novorossiya, New Russia. Sparsely populated, they were settled by Russian colonists under the supervision of Prince Potemkin, Catherine's advisor and lover. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, exhausted by war and at the mercy of its neighbours, was carved up in a series of partitions, with Russia taking the lion's share. And again, you see something that will be echoed, uh, what, 130 years later, 120 years later. Um, yeah, I guess it's 130 years, 140 years almost, when you have uh, a German state, the Weimar Republic, uh, over here, and you have the Russians, and they're going to make this agreement that they're going to carve up Poland at the start of World War II. Poland did not re-emerge as an independent nation until 1918. Russia inherited a large Jewish population from Poland, who Catherine decreed could live only in the so-called Pale of Settlement, and were excluded from most cities. In France, the French Revolution led to the execution of King Louis XVI. Catherine was horrified, and in the last years of her reign, completely turned her back on the liberal idealism of her youth. And, you know, it's interesting uh, that revolution happens and it's a weird thing that takes place because uh, France has been this source of enlightenment, but now they go off the deep end. And, and we've done videos talking about the, the terror and everything that was happening with the revolution. And, um, and, and this was a, a huge threat to the monarchies across Europe because, OK, if those people can overthrow their monarch and, and Louis was one of those absolute monarchs who still had a lot of power like Catherine. Uh, so this is a real threat and this is a real area of concern for the rest of the monarchies. And now in the aftermath of that uh, is going to rise Napoleon in France and Russia is going to be a big part of all of that. Three years later, Catherine died ending one of the most glorious reigns in Russian history. She was succeeded by her son, Paul, a man obsessed by military discipline and detail, and opposed to all his mother's works. Russia joined the coalition of European powers, fighting revolutionary France. Marshal Suvorov, one of Russia's greatest military commanders, won a series of victories against the French in northern Italy. But the wider war was a failure. Meanwhile, Paul's reforms had alienated Russia's army and nobility, and he was murdered in a palace coup. And this is not the last time that such things will happen with Russian leaders. He was succeeded by his 23-year-old son, Alexander, who shared his grandmother Catherine's vision for a more modern Russian state. His advisor, the brilliant Count Mikhail Speransky, reformed administration and finance. Yet the emperor refused to back his plans for a liberal constitution. And here's where you're going to start to see a real problem for the uh, the Russian monarchs is an inability to read the room and to understand or just an unwillingness to acknowledge the need for change where you have other monarchs in other parts of the world recognizing hey if I want to keep my throne and I want to keep this thing going I've got to just acknowledge that the world is changing and that uh, we are you know with the the American Revolution the French Revolution there's a lot of things that are changing about how countries are uh, doing self-rule and self-governance and the people are rising up and we're going to see that for the next several decades and then even into the 20th century. Ultimately, it was war with France that would dominate Alexander's reign. France had a new emperor Napoleon Bonaparte, who inflicted a series of defeats on Russia and her allies. And who was not short. He was probably about 5'8", 
which puts him right at the average height for the time. Um, I'm only five nine and a half, so I certainly don't think he's all that short. At Austerlitz, Eilau, and Friedland. But at Tilsit in 1807, the two young emperors met and made an alliance. For now. Russia attacked Sweden, annexing Finland, which became an autonomous Grand Duchy within the Russian Empire. And there, again, is something that's going to plant the seeds for a conflict that will happen a little more than 100 years later when you have the Winter War, when Russia invades Finland. Well, they're trying to take territory back that they had lost in the previous time period. But then, in 1812, Napoleon invaded Russia. Big mistake. At Borodino, French and Russian armies clashed in a gigantic battle, one of the bloodiest of the age. Napoleon emerged victorious, but the Russian army escaped intact. Napoleon occupied Moscow, which was destroyed by fire. And remember again, Moscow is not the capital of Russia, though it's still probably its most important city culturally and in terms of symbolism and things like that. St. Petersburg is the capital. Uh, but they basically abandon Moscow. They, they kind of suck Napoleon in. They draw his, armor, his army deeper and deeper into their territory in the winter. And then they burn Moscow. And so he gets Moscow. But what's, it, what, what's that mean? Now you've got a city that's been burned. You've got no food. You've got no supplies. And you've got an army that's stuck hundreds of miles behind enemy lines. And when Alexander refused to negotiate, the French army was forced to make a long retreat through the Russian winter and was annihilated. Napoleon had been dealt a mortal blow. Yep. And Russia, alongside Prussia, Austria and Britain, then led the fight back, which ended in the capture of Paris. And I mean, Napoleon lost hundreds of thousands of men in Russia. Uh, just these are some of the largest armies the world had ever seen. Certainly the, the European world had ever seen uh, in history. Uh, just the numbers killed in these battles dwarf anything that the world had seen uh, in at least in the West. Certainly in China and places like that, there are huge bloody battles that kill millions of people in these wars. But uh, in Europe, they hadn't seen anything like this. And uh, he's right. It was a mortal blow to Napoleon. If he had never gone into Russia, who knows what the world looks like today. Napoleon's abdication. At the Congress of Vienna, as part of the spoils of war, Alexander became King of Poland. Then, with Austria and Prussia, he formed the Holy Alliance with the aim of preventing further revolutions in Europe. And this is one of the first times you, you see a significant attempt to uh, balance power, to make sure things like this don't happen again. And this is going to define the next two centuries. You know, people saying, OK, we've just had this disastrous war where a lot of people died. How do we put things in place so this doesn't happen again? And of course, it does happen again. You have wars that break out uh, in Europe throughout the 19th century. Eventually, you end up with the German Empire after the Franco-Prussian War, which uh, rebalances power in Europe. And that new balance of power is what's going to lead to the First World War. And it all goes back to these events we're talking about here. Meanwhile, in the Balkans and Caucasus, Russia had been waging intermittent wars against the Ottoman Empire. Persia and local tribes. The frontier had been pushed south to incorporate Bessarabia, Circassia, Chechnya, and much of modern Georgia, Dagestan, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. And again, these are areas that have been fought over in recent decades. But the peoples of the Caucasus bitterly resisted Russian rule. Russia's attempt to impose its authority on the region led to the Caucasian War, a brutal conflict fought amongst the mountains and forests that would drag on for nearly 50 years. Alexander was succeeded by his brother Nicholas, a conservative and reactionary. 
but parts of Russian society had now developed an appetite for European-style liberalism, yep. including certain army officers who'd seen other ways of doing things during the Napoleonic Wars. They saw Nicholas as an obstacle, and the new emperor's first challenge would be military revolt. And this is going to be an ongoing thing for the rest of the empire's existence. Uh, is revolt and that, that battle between the autocratic emperors and his people and even his army. Um, it's going to be interesting to take a further look at this. But um, I'm excited to be sharing with you some really big things that I'm going to be uh, taking part in in uh, the coming months. And I'm going to probably do a separate video about that. I might even just do like a, a live stream about it. But uh, I've got a book I'm working on and I, I can't wait to tell you guys about that. Also, my next uh, trip to Europe is in the beginning stages, probably going to happen at the end of April, which is now what a month and a half or so away. So I'm excited to bring you that news. Uh, I'm going to continue to bring you more uh, videos from World War One battlefields. We've completed the Psalm series. Tomorrow, uh, a combined video with all six parts of my visit to the Psalm battlefield is going to go up. That was something that you guys requested. So I'll put that up. And then this weekend, uh, the next video in that series is going to go up on Saturday, uh, which is a look at the Muse Argonne American Cemetery and telling you some of the stories of those who are buried there. So I'm excited to bring you that. In the meantime, uh, a couple of videos uh, if you want to check out. I'll put up the links uh, here on the screen uh, for more information about what we've been talking about. One of them is the beginning of a series I did looking at the life and reign of Catherine the Great. And the other is a little bit more in-depth look at some of the Napoleonic Wars. So check that out. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.